Well, in the last concluded election, the ANC lost its majority in South Africa's parliament. Now, this is the first time this has happened since the end of apartheid. Well, joining us this morning is Mbule Nzege Leonard. He is a senior consultant at Concerto and is based in Cape Town, South Africa. Well, he's here to give us, uh, you know, let's have the conversation about the election and the prospects moving forward in South Africa. Hello, Mr. Leonard. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good, to uh, have good morning, back. Angela, and thank you for having me on air. Okay, it's good to have you back. All right, so um, let's look at the establishment of the government of the National Unity in South Africa. And now that happened between 1994 and 1997. Now, looking at that, what negotiations does the ANC need to undertake with other parties before the 18th of June, which is the constitutional deadline to elect the country's next president, particularly in light of the recent election results in South Africa? So just a bit of a historical background, the government of national unity that was established between 1994 to 1997 occurred within the context of South Africa entering a new political dispensation. That is, it was transitioning from over 300 years of white political domination, that is colonialism and apartheid, into a multi-party into a uh, multi -party democracy, which was inclusive, that is, it had included representation for all racial groups. Now, what prompted the government of national unity to be, to be established during that time frame was in the lead up to the transition towards um, democracy and the end of apartheid, you had antagonistic groups. That is, the, for example, the Inkata Freedom Party, um, which was reluctant to abide to the transition towards the end of democracy. And there was a lot of violence between them and the ANC, which led to an estimated 20,000 deaths. Um, that is a balance between those two um, entities. And then you had also the National Party, that was the party which was in charge of South Africa during apartheid, um, which had had significant government experience. And because the ANC had no government experience, they needed to include them, first and foremost, to give confidence to their international partners that they had individuals who at least had an understanding of how to pursue and undertake government action, as well as to appease the white minority, which had been scared with respect to what would be their future in the new um, political dispensation. That being said, South Africa is entering a new political landscape wherein there's going to be significant competition. And this has been, um, you know, we, we manifested through the loss of the majority by the ANC. And a president needs to be elected by the 14th, because now that's the day that has been set by Parliament, so it's a new development. Um, negotiations have been undertaken by the ANC. They've been very, very honest, um, and they've been very forthright, and even humble in their um, declarations ever since the um, shocking of results. We saw them fall to 40.7%. In fact, when you aggregate the data with um, the national, with the regional election results, the ANC overall had 39%. So they understand that a lot of the country's voting population did not select them. So in order to be able to elect the president on Friday, which is presumptively going to be um, the incumbent, Sir Ramaphosa, what has to happen is that the ANC needs to be able to secure enough votes to get 201 votes, that is the majority plus one because of the 400C parliament. But then also in the event that you have, for example, the MK party, which is not, um, going to participate, they have to have at least a quorum, which enables them, that is one third of the parliament, parliament members, and then now within that quorum to get a majority, which allows them to um, elect the president. Okay, so now looking at the ANC and the steps they need to take. Now, and President Ramaphosa, we understand some parties have said they would not work with him if they're to form a collision together. Now, does President Ramaphosa characterize the current state of the nation's leadership needs? Well, only one party has explicitly said that they aren't going to work with President Ramaphosa. Well, that is, they will work with the ANC, but on the basis that he won't serve as the um, as as a, as a party's president, as the candidate they put forward to be the head of state. Yeah. But then the MK has somewhat backtracked on it because last week they did send a delegation to pursue negotiations, or at least to pursue initial talks with respect to potentially joining the government and national unity. That being said, 
President Ramaphosa and the ANC are in a significantly weakened position. It's unprecedented because, as you noted, for the last 30 years, the ANC has been the dominant force in South African politics. In fact, they've even had a hegemonic position. But herewith, now you have a scenario where they have to put cards on the table and make concessions. But that being said, even though they are in a weakened position, President Ramaphosa is the strongest leader within the ANC. When you look at other individuals, for example, Deputy President Poma Shatile, if President Ramaphosa was to say he's not standing, there will be a lot of issues because uh, the Deputy President is has been accused of um, corruption during the previous administration under Jacob Zuma, and then other ANC leaders aren't necessarily up to the task of running the presidency. Um, even amongst opposition leaders, they, for example, the um, Democratic Alliance, the second largest party in the country, the largest opposition, they would prefer a scenario where he is the head of state. So the ANC, even though they are in a weakened position and President Ramaphosa has taken a lot of the blame for the uh, poor election results, nevertheless, the fact that they are the largest party which will lead this government of national unity, they still have cards on the table which they can use, but nevertheless, they still have to make a lot of concessions in that regard to make sure that they have an arrangement which is palpable for them to not lose too much political control over the next five years. So, Mr. Leonard, how will these changes affect the, the perception of the South African government by the international market, looking at the new major changes that will be made you know, by the governments that we're expecting? Yes, and this just speaks to who they are going to go into the go national, government of national unity with. President Ramaphosa has invited all 18 parties, including the ANC, that is 18 parties that gained um, representation in the parliament. But then amongst those, only three have more than 10% of the vote. So now there's a scenario where people are worrying that, you know, there are too many different ideologies. There are too much. There's basically too many ingredients in the pot of soup, if, as we like to say in West Africa. But nevertheless, um, there are some policy positions where there's some parties where the markets and investors have said they are more favorable towards the ANC getting into coalition or getting to government with, such as the Democratic Alliance. Um, they are perceived as a business-friendly party. The IFP is also socially conservative, and they believe that those two parties having leading roles in the government and national unity would streamline corruption. It would enable the president, or it would enable Ramaphosa to pursue deep-seated um, social economic reforms. However, these parties differ significantly on, for example, social protection. The DA has been very vocal in the past against um, affirmative action and race-based quotas, which are some of the landmark legislations and policies that the ANC has pursued. And as a result, that's one of the reasons why we didn't have a coalition um, government which was pursued, because a lot of backlash came out from the NEC, that's the National Executive Council of the ANC, amongst the veterans, as well as the alliance partners, such as the Confederation of South African Trade Unions and the um, uh, South African Communist Party, as well as the South African National Civic Organization. They said that a pro-black coalition, that is um, parties that uh, appeal to the black majority, such as the EFF, the MK, which is led by former President Zuma, and others should be, filled, should be forming the coalition. And the markets haven't re uh, reacted very uh, favorably towards that because they believe that these parties are going to pursue a lot of state interventionist policies. They want to nationalize mines, banks, as well as other strategic uh, um, aspects of society, uh, of, of the economy. They also want to increase fiscal expenditure on social protection measures, which would uplift the majority, which the black majority, some a, a, a significant um, proportion of whom find themselves in poverty as well as states of inequality. And to that, you even had the African peer review mechanism, that is the African Union's um, Accountability and Government Promotion Agency, which criticized uh, United States-based um, Fitch ratings for stipulating that an ANC DA coalition will be better for the markets, accusing mm -hmm. them of meddling. So, you know, there are lots of different options on the table, but at this point in time, it's going to be very difficult. Well, not difficult, but then, um, there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to which direction that the ANC is going to go because they don't want a scenario where they're going to eliminate their supporters, um, you know, just to appease uh, the markets as well as um, investors. But at the same time, 
They also don't want to alienate that very important aspect of society, well, those very important stakeholders. Okay, so let's look at the future, the political future of the ANC. Now, for the first time, they have to share power. Is there any coming back from this, you know, this incident? Let's put it that way. Is there any coming back from this? Is there in any future, are we looking at the ANC regaining full power in the South African uh, government scene? Well, right now, we're writing a post-electoral report uh, at Concerto, and one of the things we're going to outline is that um, people are paying a lot of attention to the near term, that is the government and national unity and how the markets are going to react to it. But then the South African population in general has landed a very, very hard blow to the ANC. And long term, this just underscores that we are going to be in a scenario where the ANC is no longer having a dominant position in the South African political landscape. It's going to be significantly more competitive. And what's interesting is that the competition has actually arisen from the internal factionalism that prevailed in the ANC over the last you know, 15 years or so. The EFF and the MK were just factions in the ANC which had disputes with the leaders and now have emerged as political forces. We're also going to see more identity-based voting. You have the Patriotic Alliance, which was able to derive a lot of the colored vote. The, for, for, for our non-South African viewers, that's the mixed population. And you know the DA was also able to consolidate the white vote. So now what we're going to have is we're going to have a lot more competition. We're going to have a lot more identity-based politics um, pursued in South Africa rather than on the basis of ideology. And in that regard, the ANC is going to find it difficult to re-establish their dominance not only to establish their dominance but for example we have the local elections which are going to take place in 2026 you've had service delivery issues municipalities have been failing because of the reduced state capacity to you know improve the livelihoods of their residents and this could be another blow to the anc because um already they've lost kzn the kwazulu natal province um their majority there the Western Cape where I am, they haven't been in control since 2009. And now we're going to have a scenario where municipalities such as, you know, Johannesburg, Pretoria, um, which are already in the hands of the opposition, could have further losses for the ANC. And then now you have Durban, which is the largest city in KwaZulu-Natal, could potentially fall into the opposition. That is the MK. So, you know, not only in terms of national and provincial level politics, but then even at the level of the municipalities and the metropolitans, the ANC is going to experience more and more competition, which will lead to a further loss of their influence. Mm. So what major domestic challenges with the new South African government encounter? Now, let's look at this particularly in regards to stimulating economic growth, job creation and addressing structural uh, inequality. Economics. That is one of the major issues that you know South Africans were speaking to with respect to how they reacted in how they voted in the past elections. South Africa has had 0.8 average 0.8 percent economic growth over the last decade. In fact, in the last quarter, the economy contracted. South Africa has an over 30 percent unemployment rate, and some metrics, some measures stipulate that that is over 50 percent, especially amongst the youth. So. The government needs to resolve a lot of the structural issues. We've been dealing with an energy crisis for close to 15 years, what we call here load shedding. Mm. And that has had a significantly negative impact on overall economic activity. Infrastructure, um, for example, the World Bank put out a report with respect to the competitiveness of African ports. Cape Town ranked last, Cape Town ports ranked last, and Durban, which used to have the largest traffic volume of ports on the continent, also ranked very low. There's a need to improve the country's infrastructure. I've already spoken to energy, infrastructure, transport, as well as the ports to stimulate economic activity. The education system needs to be reformed. There are a lot of skills which need to be developed for the economy to um, operate at an optimal um, level, which aren't being taught in the, in the um, current education system. That needs to be addressed. Corruption. Anger towards corruption, which has prevailed particularly over the last 15 years, is one of the reasons why the ANC was given this knockout punch with respect to the election results. The ANC needs to be able to address that further because now the corruption is also having a significant impact on 
the level of economic activity and their ability to deliver services, especially at the local level. Okay, so let's look at the populace now. Are, what's the people's reaction to this? Are they looking forward to this kind of government? Or are people wishing more for a system where they just have one party which is in control? Well, from a, I have a lot of people in my life from a lot of the spectrums, politicals, particularly from the ANC, and they said they knew it coming. They had it coming because the party has underperformed very significantly over, and I keep saying over the last 15 years. Ramaphosa was given a blank check in 2019. We had this thing called Ramaporia. That was the wave of um, optimism that he would be able to, you know, remedy the shortcomings that had ex we had experienced during the Zuma administration. But then, you know, we have, for example, during um, the COVID pandemic, a lot of money was stolen from public funds which are allocated to, you know, um, pursue the fight against COVID. You've had an overall economic decline. So the population, you know, they did what we, know, what we call performance-based voting, wherein they were giving their votes to the parties that they would expect to do better and taking them away, that is, from the party that they expected not to do well, that is the ANC. So now we've gotten past that stage and there is a feeling of uncertainty because in as much as, you know, a lot of people didn't want the ANC to have a leading role that is as having a dominant role in the dispensation of, you know, decision making and running the country. Now it's a matter of who will they do this with? Because, for example, the majority of the population, the black majority, is still feeling the effects of inequality, poverty, as well as economic decline compared to the majority, the uh, white minority. The ANC, the EFF and MK, these are parties which have said that they can pursue um, redistributionalist policies which address this. But at the same time, they understand that these are parties which can also be antagonistic towards the ANC in terms of allowing them to rule properly. But on the other hand, Democratic Alliance, they have been ideologically opposed to the ANC, such that even if they do have strong institutional foundations, even though they have performed oversight well in Parliament, a lot of the population still says that, you know what, we don't trust them. We don't want them to be in charge. We can't fathom the leader of the D Democratic Alliance, um, uh, John Stuenhuisen. They can't fathom him, a white man, as the deputy president of the country. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but then there's also a great desire, as we're seeing with the, re the voting results, for South Africa to embark on a path of renewal, growth, and prosperity. Okay. Mr. Leonard, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us those updates. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me on air, and I hope to see you soon. We hope to see you soon, too. Okay, we have been speaking about South Africa's ANC's drive to build a national collision government. Now, we've been speaking to Mr. Leonard. He is a senior consultant at Concerto, and he is based in Cape Town, South Africa. And that's it today on Global Digest. Remember to watch us live on DSTV, channel 258, on Star Times, channel 140, Abu TV app, Limex World TV app and Niger TV app. For more stories, visit our website on adbntv.com. Not forgetting, you can watch us live from every part of the world by logging on to adbntv.com slash live. Thanks for joining me today. Let's do this same time tomorrow. I am Ama Marcus. Good morning. <laughs>